Okay guys, today I'm going to show you how I do a qPCR or a quantitative PCR. Just something to keep in mind, when I was doing this test it was for diagnostics, so we were looking for two different infections uh, in this particular animal. Let's get started. Yep, so the first thing I'm doing is ordering my samples. Uh, in this particular test, I was looking at samples from three different locations, so I'm just pulling them apart to make sure I have every sample I want from each of those locations. Yeah, so this is a qPCR map. Um, I'd start with the map and not any of my reaction volumes or anything like that, because I want to make sure I've counted the right number of things. So the first thing you've got to put in is your samples, the second thing is your negative template control, third thing is your positive controls, and then fourthly, you need to double all of that because you're going to do technical duplicates. You're not just running each sample once, you're running it twice to make sure there's no mistakes made. You want those two versions to agree with each other. So in this case, that brings me to a total of 66 different samples. So now that I know how many samples I want, I'm going to go to my lab book. I like to keep my lab book tidy. It's not for my scrap calculations for me. Um, for me, it is what I actually did. Not what I intended to do, but what I actually did. So you can see I'm now writing out my master mix calculations. That's going to include my buffer, my enzymes, my probes. Um, there are different things you can add depending on what you're trying to do, what concentrations you're using, or what kit you're using. So I don't want to give you exact volumes because it's going to be different for you. Yeah, so first I wrote out those concentrations at a one time, so how much I would need for one reaction, and then I wrote it out at 70 times. I give myself about 10% extra. Um, there's nothing worse than getting halfway through a plate and then discovering that you don't have enough to finish the plate. Okay, so putting all those components together now in a tube. This tube does not need to be well labeled. You, it's only going to be around for a few minutes. I really like having my reagents for a single experiment in a single freezer box like this yellow one so I can just pull it out and get started and I've got all the right concentrations um, of my reagents. So the concentrations I actually use of my reagents go here. So you can also see in the little tubes the positive controls that I often use just at the useful dilution. So back in the freezer I'll have a much larger sample at a much higher concentration um, but just to make sure that those original stocks aren't going through freezing and thawing cycles I just have the little ones in my freezer box here. Yep, so this is the qPCR plate and you can see that I'm lining out exactly uh, where each of my samples is going to go. That little duplicate there is my negative control and the four in a box together are my two different positive controls. I like to tape these plates down. Um, these particular plates are quite light and skittery, so as you're pipetting into the plate, it can start moving around a bit. Okay, so you can see that I'm pipetting the master mix into every single well. It's a very repetitive process. There's nothing different. Everything in that master mix needs to be in every single one of those wells that I'm about to use. So I'm reusing this pipette tip here, but if I was ever to touch the side or touch my own hand or touch the desk or anything that I was worried about, I would just get rid of that tip and keep going. Yep, so now I'm just checking to make sure that I got all the liquid inside. So I'm just having a quick look around, make sure there's liquid in the right wells um, and that there's none up on the side, which would mean that I missed. So now it's time to put the sample in. You want to be really careful with the sample, it's quite a small volume. So with the master mix I wasn't too fussed, I can very easily visually see where it's going. But now that there's already liquid inside that well, I need to be careful not to fail to expel the liquid or I just wanted to make double sure that I've pushed out this small amount of liquid. So I'm going to pipette, instead of the master mix which I just pipetted down into the bottom, I'm going to pipette the sample onto the side of the well there. So there's a few different ways I've got of making sure what I'm putting where. So the change in volume from 6 microliters of master mix to the additional 3 microliters-ish of sample that's going into these wells um, is hard to visually distinguish. Um, so you can see I have two methods, or even three actually, of making sure it's going the right place. So the first one is that I've got that sharpie on the side of the wells to show where my samples are going in descending order and the technical duplicates are by each other's side. 
The second method I've got is my pipette tip box. So the first sample is that top left, and then I'm gonna go down my tip box so I can tell by my tips which ones I've actually expelled. Um, and then my third method is across on my purple tray. You can see that I'm very obviously moving the samples quite far away, but still in order when I'm done with them. So if someone distracts me or if there's a fire alarm or if something happens and I get distracted, I've got three different ways potentially of telling where I'm up to. And then finally the Sharpie scratch so that I make sure that visually I'm lining up with the next correct downwards column. Yeah. Keep in mind as well, you wanna be very gentle and slow with these steps. Um, so this is currently sped up 400 times real speed. So you wanna be nice and slow and gentle as you're doing this, especially if it's your first time. Yeah. When I was just starting, I found it really helped to say out loud what sample was going where and to double check with the map underneath me. I don't do that anymore, but it was really helpful at the beginning. So we're coming up to the negative control and also the two positive controls. I have two positive controls here because I'm looking for two different infections in these animals. So I use more master mix for my negative template control. I don't put water in. Um, because there's no water in this reaction, adding water to my negative control would not be a true negative test. Um, so, plastic lid on top, easy. Okay, so now we need to put our plate in the plate spinner. So if you looked at each individual well right now, because we've just been pipetting sample up onto the side, if we put this straight into the QPCR machine, the sample's gonna be up here, the master mix is gonna be down here, and you're not gonna get a reaction because they're not sharing space. Um, so you just give it a quick, gentle spin um, so that it all sits at the bottom of the well and it's going to react together. Uh, again, keep in mind that I was very quick there in the video, but in real life it was quite slow. That's probably two to four hundred times better. Yep, so pop it in the Byron machine, take out the plate that someone else left in there. It was definitely me earlier that morning. At this point I was doing about three QPCRs a day, so I was just cycling through them. Yep, so here I'm setting my run conditions, but that doesn't take long because I'm doing the exact same QPCR just on different samples um, every day. So I've already preset it. I'm just loading previous templates here. What does change is exactly what samples you've put in. So I find it's worth it to spend some time um, saying what those samples are now, especially if you're doing multiple QPCRs a day. My QPCR takes about one hour 38 minutes, or at least that's what it tells me. I think it takes more like one hour 42. It's always a little inaccurate. So at the end, you get your results. Um, analyzing QPCR would be a whole other video, um, but you can just see here very quickly, I am just checking that my positive controls worked, my negative controls didn't amplify, um, because either of those things failing would mean I just need to rerun the whole plate. So I want to know that quickly so I can just go straight away and put it on if something has gone wrong. Um, but this one looks pretty good. I'm just switching between the two different fluorescences that I was looking at because they indicate the two different infections I was looking for. Okay, so that's it. I hope you found this helpful. I always wish that I had been able to see someone really do a QPCR before I'd been able to do it the first time. Um, because there are little tips and tricks that can make it go easier. I think the most important thing to remember the first time you're doing it is go slow, especially if you're doing a full 96 well or 384 well plate, because once you miss pipette something, it can just ruin the whole plate. Other than that, please like and subscribe for more of this sort of content. I'd love to show you guys how I do a lot of different tests that I do every day. Let me know in the comments if you have any questions about QPCR. Just keep in mind that every lab is going to have a different protocol and a different QPCR kit. Other than that, See you next time.